Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Our program today features Ashley Sanders, who is a member of the Executive Committee of Move to Amend, the national organization advocating for the development of a pro-democracy movement in the United States. It might seem odd in the United States, which proclaims itself the greatest democracy in the world, that we would need a democracy movement, but in fact, few people do advocate for democracy or understand what democracy looks like or what conditions are required for one to, fact, to function effectively. People are much more likely to advocate for single issues, but not be concerned for the condition of the democracy in which we operate. The most immediate goal of Move to Amend is passage of a 28th constitutional amendment to firmly establish that corporations, be they for-profit or non-profit, are not people and do not have constitutional rights, and that money is not speech but rather property, and subject to regulation or possible bans as the Congress and or state legislatures or local governments may see appropriate. Ashley Sanders was in Portland recently to address these issues and spoke in front of an audience organized by the Alliance for Democracy at the First Unitarian Church. I want to thank Jim Lockhart for recording this presentation and allowing our use. I think that history is powerful, A, because I'm a nerd, and B, because I think it is a story of how power works, and we need to know that story if we want to create our own story of how people power works in defiance of how elite power works. And so I want to tell the story of corporate power, which is a very, very long story in general, and I'm going to condense it into a semi-medium long story, maybe. Briefly, Move to Amend is, as I said, a national, multi-ethnic, multi-racial coalition of affiliates, community organizers, and a national leadership team that is calling for an amendment to the Constitution to say emphatically that corporations are not people, that they should not have the human rights that are intended only for humans, as evidenced by the adjective human before rights, and that money is not speech, which means that corporations should not have the First Amendment right to free speech, that they have interpreted as meaning that they get to spend as much money, their way of speaking, in elections as they possibly can. And so we are working to pass an amendment to the Constitution to overturn those two doctrines as a first step in creating a genuine democracy. That's the first prong of Move to Amend's plan. The second prong is to create a true participatory genuine democracy movement and democracy in the United States. And that is a much bigger plan. And so the amendment is our, our tactic, our way of starting to organize around issues of corporate rule and start fighting for genuine little d democracy and start creating that in our communities and in our regions and in this country so that we can actually have the power culturally, politically, legally, etc., to create the world that we want to see. So Move to Amend is a democracy movement and we're trying to change the concept of what that means to us. A democracy is not going out and pulling a lever on election day and then waiting again for two years to do it the next time. It's not a choice between the dude in the black suit and the dude in the blue suit. It's about making decisions as communities that affect our lives and it's about people who are impacted by decisions making those decisions. Corporate control of our government and a corporate controlled economy is not inevitable. It's like everything else in this human made world. It's made by us, right? Or it's made by some of us and that's the problem. It's created and if something can be created, it can be uncreated, right? It can be dismantled, it can be changed and that's a very empowering thing to know about history. All forms of oppression are created so all forms of oppression can be dismantled and that's what we're here to do is figure out how to dismantle the great oppression of corporate rule of our lives. So how do corporations become the things that they are? Let's start this story back where it starts which is about 500 years ago. And by the way, as a little caveat, whenever I say corporation in this story, I want to be clear that I'm talking about multinational 
uh, corporations that take over our government and take over our lives and make decisions for us. I'm not talking about the mom and pop business down the street. I'm not talking about people that are trying to make a living by doing something that's worthwhile in their communities. So we're not against people doing that. We're against people doing that at our expense without our consent, right? So just keep that in your mind so you don't think, hey, she doesn't like my bagel business or whatever it is. I, I guarantee you I like your bagel business. So let's start this story where it starts about 500 years ago when there were Roman corporations, but we're going to skip that. And I promise you it won't take 500 years to tell this story, but we're going to start 500 years ago when the advent of the corporation came into being. How did it come into being? Well, there's a guy named, well, he wasn't named a king, but there was a certain guy who ruled England, known as the king, and this king in, the, in about the 14 and 1500s was having some problems, right? He was a little bit broke. He was broke because he did what a lot of kings do, which is fight foreign wars at his people's expense to increase his riches, right? But instead of increasing his riches, it hadn't treated him so well, and he wasn't doing so hot. And so he thought, hmm, how can I make more money? I've already done all the things that I normally do by breaking the backs of the poor, etc. So what can I really do? Meanwhile, in the same land, there were some uh, very wealthy elites, men, in case you're wondering, who decided that they would also like to make a heap of money at some other people's expenses. And in this instance, it was the expenses of people who lived in lands that these men believed had discovered but that had existed just fine before these men ever got there and that contained valuable resources and large human populations that these men saw as objects of exploitation and wealth and so they said well we want to go out and make some riches off of this new world but it's a pretty risky business because the last time we checked people don't really like being taken over and they don't like having their resources vacuumed out of their countries and so it's kind of a little dangerous they might rise up we might lose ships at sea we don't know really what to do so I know let's go to that king guy he's always been pretty in favor of what we do and so they went to the king and they said we want to go out and we want to earn vast amounts of money by exploiting and extracting resources and we need your cover basically and the king said, well, that's good because I was just looking for a way to get rich and I wasn't really sure how I was going to do it. So how about we make a deal? I will charter you as something called a corporation. And as a corporation, you can do all sorts of really cool things like live forever and also be protected from liability for the decisions that you make. And in exchange, I'd like a little bit of skimming off of your profits. And they all scratched their heads and hemmed and hawed and then shook hands and said, deal. We are a corporation now, we live forever, we have what's called limited liability, meaning that we don't have to take full responsibility for the actions that we take and the mistakes that we make in case we lose money or ships or there's some kind of insurrection or whatever. And yeah, we'll give you some of our profits. That was the birth, happy birthday to the modern corporation. That was its first breath, right? And these. The features of this deal are very important because they're going to exist for a long time up to this current minute on this current day of this year, right? And one of them is that the corporate form is a collusion between elites in the government and elites in the economy that is supposedly supposed to benefit both, but actually in the end ends up bankrupting the government and benefiting the economic elites, right? Or they become the same thing. And so that's one feature of corporate rule, right? Of multinational corporate rule. Another feature is when this happened, that's very important too, right? And it happened when a lot of people wanted to go out and exploit and extract resources from other lands. And I want to be very clear that it is not an accident that the, cor the modern corporation grew up at the same time as the most massive expansion of globalized exploitation and imperialism that the world had ever seen. It was, in fact, the vehicle for that expansion, and it provided the liability shield and the funds and the um, wherewithal to basically achieve these ends, right? And so the corporation is basically a concentration vehicle. It makes things more potent, it makes profits more potent, and it makes damage more potent for the people who have to live under this system, right? 
And so forget whatever you've heard about the free market. The government needs to participate in chartering and creating laws that protect the multinational corporation, right? This is important because we're thinking about structures. If we want to dismantle a structure of corporate rule, we need to know the players involved. And the players involved are political folks, right? And these economic elites. So moving on, we're gonna just run through the next few hundred years until we get to about 1750. And we have a lot of things going on, including that a lot of people who wanted to make a lot of money have come over to the United States, or it was not the United States, but they have come over to this country and set up shop over here to make a lot of money as well. And we also have Cruising the Seas, the most powerful company, corporation that has ever existed, ever. Does anybody know the name of that corporation? East India, East India Company, yeah, very good. The British East India Company, it makes Walmart look like a toddler in diapers, right? It has the most massive amount of control that the world has ever seen. It has its own court system. It controls giant swaths of land and has brought in entire cultures under its jurisdiction and, and, and its control, right? And it also, favorably for it, is funded by members of the British Parliament, right? Almost every member of the British Parliament owns stocks in this corporation. And so what kinds of laws is the British Par Parliament going to pass when they go and pass laws? Are they going to pass laws that favor common people? Or are they going to pass laws that favor the British East India Company? I think you all made your guess, even though you didn't say it out loud. And yeah, they, they make laws that favor the British East India Company, right? And a lot of those laws are laws that we learned about in high school civics class that we glossed over in the story that we were told about the American Revolution. And they were glossed over on the way to the most important point for most of high school civics teachers, at least my high school civics teacher, which was that the American Revolution was a revolution for democracy all over the land, for political rights, and that the people got political rights, and we've been singing kumbaya ever since, right? That's the story that I was told. And that story is false on so many levels, I'm really not even sure where to begin. But we'll begin by saying that, th that all revolutions, that no revolution is just political ever, right? All revolutions are both political and economic because they're fighting a fusion of power that is both political and economic, right? And the corporation is the classic kind of apotheosis of a political and economic vehicle for power. It's the collusion of economic and political might, right? And so when the American Revolution began, there are a lot of people fighting for political rights. They're saying overthrow the king, overthrow the tyranny of power politically that is known as the king or the monarch, right? And that story has its conclusions and we'll go into that. But have you ever thought before to yourself, wait a minute, what about the economic side of this revolution? What about the story about people fighting against economic tyranny? And what was that in the form of? That's the question that I started to ask that led me to reading this kind of stuff that led me to understanding this story, right? And it's important to remember that the American colonies besides being colonies that existed on indigenous people's land and committed genocide against indigenous people, were also actual corporate charters, right? 12 of the 13 colonies in the United States in the colonial period were corporate charters. They were tracts of land given to somebody or a few people or a company to make that company very rich. And they brought over to America the kinds of people who would work for the very rich, namely, Poor people, people who had gotten out of jail, kids who were walking on the wrong street one day who got swept up in kidnapping raids, indentured servants, and Africans who were enslaved to make the plantations run, essentially, right? So there were all sorts of people who knew the score politically and economically about how power worked because they had basically been the labor force that made this country, right? Or that colonized this country. And so when the American Revolution happened and there were a lot of people talking about you know, getting rid of the divine right of kings and talking about monarchy, they were saying, hold on, hold on, wait a minute. There are some other issues going on here. There are some other problems that I'd like to bring to the table. And they're decidedly both economic and political. And I would not just like to overthrow the king. I would like to overthrow all forms of concentrated tyranny that have power over my lives. And these people are people we don't hear about because they operated largely in bands with no name. 
and they were poor and the rich write history and so we don't hear about them but they did some amazing things and they were active all over in the 13 colonies and they were so powerful that they set the agenda for a lot of the stuff that happened in Boston and these other seaport towns that we do hear about, right? And they were so radical in their analysis of what needed to change that people in Boston were saying, okay, okay, cool it, Western Massachusetts, cool it. We'll do something, we'll do something. Uh, the British, or the Boston Tea Party, that's it, that's what we'll do. That was largely a reaction to the kind of organizing that was going on all around the country led by people who were poor and indentured or women or slaves or whatever fill in the blank group. Um, and it's important because one of the defining acts of the American Revolution that we hear about in school is this Boston Tea Party, right? And we get it inside this story of political rights and political autonomy and political revolutions and we say, okay, yeah, that makes sense. But if you think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense just as a political act, right? Just as an act to overthrow a king. Why would you target the, the British East India Tea Company sitting in the Boston Harbor? It makes a lot more sense when you realize that corporations like the British East India Tea Company were setting the political agenda for Parliament because Parliament depended on the British East India Tea Company for their stocks and also for their political power at this point, and that those laws were the onerous laws that caused people to make an economic and political resistance movement and rise up against it. So when people throw tea in the Boston Harbor, they aren't just throwing tea saying no more king, they're saying no more form of economic and political tyranny, right? That's not a story that I heard, but it makes that story make a whole lot more sense, right? And so then you have all these other actions, a whole revolutionary war, and then the dust settles and you have something that's known as the Constitution, right? This is where the story gets very important. And I'm not here to just be like a Debbie Downer that shoots starts into all of your balloons of hope or whatever and says, none of these stories are true. I'm telling the story for a very specific reason so we understand how to fight against the forms of power that we are facing today. And also to be honest about the people who have suffered at the expense of power in our country's history. And so at the time that the Constitution um, was twinkling in some people's eyes, we have very distinct groups on the ground. I got a story once again of a bunch of people who all agreed with each other, all wanted the same things, all came to the Constitutional Convention to write a liberty document that would forever change the course of America. But in reality, when you have a revolution against a common enemy, you have a lot of groups, disparate groups with disparate ideals and desires, right, that want to fight together for that moment. But when that enemy is gone, when the revolution is successful, they usually break apart into their respective groups again, right? And there was, that was happening, just like it does everywhere, in the American colonies after the Revolutionary War. And there was, once again, a whole class of people, a whole group of people that were fighting as they had always been against economic and political power. These people were comprised of small farmers, they were comprised of indentured servants, they were comprised of Africans who had been enslaved, they were women, and they were fighting for what they had been fighting for originally, right? Which was an end to these forms of tyranny. But there were also people whose names we hear about a lot more who had been fighting against the monarchy for a very different reason. And for many of those people, the American Revolution was less of a revolution and more of a middle management coup, right? They were rich men in America who wanted what the rich men in England had, and they didn't like the control that those rich men in England were having over their lives. And when they got rid of those rich men in England's rule over their lives, they actually wanted a lot of the same things as they had been fighting, right? They wanted to consolidate their wealth and power and form a country and a nation and a government that would help them to do that. And so at the time, America was living under the Articles of Confederation, right? Which was very different than the Constitution. And, um, and these men said, well, we'd really like to do a few things. We'd like to make a lot of money on Western land speculation. We'd like the creditors in the country to be able to uh, make the debtors of the country pay. And we'd like for the stocks that we've bought in the US government to, um, to rise and to be actually lucrative. And we'd like a military power that defends our trade. And we'd like to get rich in trade by, by consolidating across, trade or across state lines. And we can't do that under the Articles of Confederation. And we want to do that. And then you have people like Daniel Shays and the debtor class and the farmer class who are saying, we want an end to debt. 
We want an end to property. We want a radical change in this society, and we want political and economic equality and justice and rights in this government. And those were the tensions going on at the time. And so the richest men in the country went to the Articles of Confederation Congress, and they said, we just want to meet and uh, talk about whether or not the Articles of Confederation is actually you know, meeting the trade needs of this country. Can we do that? Can we meet? And the Articles of Confederation Congress said, all right, sure, and go meet. And so they met, and they met in Philadelphia, and I'm not trying to sound like a conspiracy theorist. This is all historical fact. They joined each other, some of the richest men in America, for a secret meeting, the notes of which were not result released for many decades. And instead of reforming the Articles of Confederation, they wrote an entirely new document known as the Constitution that changed the entire course of this country, right? And corporate anthropologist Jane Ann Morris calls the Constitution the first NAFTA because it was written in secret by economic elites in order to consolidate trade across, uh, across territory lines, right? At, for the express benefit of economic elite interests, right? And that is not what we hear about the Constitution, and I'm not trying to say, woo, look behind the great Oz curtain. I'm trying to say that this document that we normally attribute our democratic ideals to was not actually, in the words of its writers, a democratic document. It was an economic document designed to consolidate wealth. And when people brought that document back, to the people for ratification, which was done very quickly with not a lot of education, the people who had been fighting for a broader political and economic justice said, no way, we just fought an entire war with y'all and this is what you bring to us, we're not buying it. And so if you want this ratified by the states, you gotta do a bunch of things, including amend 10 amendments to this document, call it the Bill of Rights, and give us a basic modicum of human rights that are protected from intrusions by the state. And that is the story of how we got what we call the Bill of Rights, right? The first 10 amendments to the Constitution that protect very basic things, very basic political rights for human beings, right? Like, name some of them. What do they protect? Freedom of speech? Press and religion, assembly, freedom from search and seizure, right? What's sorry? Firearms, yeah privacy, right? So very important things. And I want to, I told this story because when I talk about democracy and the history of American democracy, I'm actually really talking about the Bill of Rights mostly, right? I'm talking about the Bill of Rights and I'm talking about the sentiments expressed in the Declaration of Independence, that people are created equal, right? Well, men, but that people are created equal and that we all have an equal say and right to participate in our government and that we should be protected from forms of tyranny, right? And those ideas contained in the Declaration of Independence are hypocritical and they were written hypocritically like most great documents are. And so the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights are unfinished stories, always to be continued stories of political rights in this country, right? So they're the political side of the resistance. They give political rights and political expressions of equality to people. And people fought really hard for those documents. And the history of the United States, as the historian and activist Molly Ivins has said, can be seen as the history of whole masses of people who were not included in that Declaration of Independence or that Constitution or that Bill of Rights the first time around, organizing to drive themselves into that document to count as legal persons, right? Because if you are a legal person in this country, you get access to the Bill of Rights and you are accorded more of the sentiments expressed in the Declaration of Independence. So being a person is a pretty awesome thing to be. But does anybody want to guess, even after the Bill of Rights was amended to the Constitution, how many people counted as people in this country? In other words, how many people actually got the protection of those Bills of Rights? What percentage? 5%? We've got a very, good, yeah, so it's actually between eight and 10% of the population. So in the Occupy movement, we talk about the 99%. This is straight up the 90% of people who did not count politically in this country. And our country, when I talk about the good things about the United States, I'm talking about those people who said, wait a minute, I know how to do math. I should be in that 100%, and I'm going to form a movement to do that. And I'm talking about the people who wrote the Bill of Rights because they wanted protections against violence and tyranny. And I'm talking about the expressions, very unfinished expressions in the Declaration of Independence. 
I'm actually not talking that much about the Constitution. And that doesn't mean that the Constitution doesn't have good things in it or doesn't have important things in it. What it does mean is that a lot of people whose names that we don't really hear or know fought really hard for us to get the protections that we actually enjoy now and that we have that I believe that we have to honor them by recognizing how they got those rights and that we have a lot of stuff to continue in, in the form of work, right? Work as activists and organizers and people in this country. And so that's the political side of it, right? We create the Bill of Rights and the Bill of Rights applies to persons and it gives us some political autonomy and political protections in this country. And we're gonna loop back to that, but just remember in your brain that being an, a person, a legal person, in the United States is a pretty awesome thing to be, right? Because it protects you and it gives you the rights that humans deserve. You've been watching Ashley Sanders from the Executive Committee of Move to Amend. Visit their website at www.movetoamend.org or our Portland website at movetoamendpdx.org. Here in Oregon, you can be involved in advancing a constitutional amendment by going to OregonRestoresDemocracy.org and signing up to contact your state representative and senator to support House Joint Memorial 6. HJM 6 states the desire of the legislature that Oregon's congressional delegation send to the state a constitutional amendment to eliminate the court-created doctrines that corporations are people, and that money is speech. I also want to invite folks in Portland to join the Alliance for Democracy at a special event. Progressive talk show host Tom Hartman will be at the First Unitarian Church on Friday, April 26th at 7 p.m. for a single speaking event. The presentation topic is Enacting the 28th Amendment, Corporations Are Not People, and money is not speech. This is a Sewell Lecture Speaking of Justice. The First Unitarian Church is located at Southwest 12th and Main in downtown Portland. Populous Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populous Dialogues. Click on the option with the Statue of Liberty icon and don't forget to subscribe to the series. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Learn more at the national website at www.thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland, Oregon website at www.afd-pdx.org. Well, that's our show today. Thank you for watching. I hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye.